Uh, hello, and welcome to Cinema 105. We are in week nine, and the topic is public relations. Let's get right into it. All right. So public relations, our topic. Here we go. So we're in week nine. We're going to answer three discussion questions, as always, from the lecture. But I also want you to start thinking about your final paper topic you will propose a topic for approval by me. What issue do you want to research? What interests you? What have you learned in the class that's maybe stimulated your thoughts? Or what is an issue or something interesting that you've had in your mind to, to explore? Uh, the final paper proposal will be due in week 12. So that's three weeks out, but I want you to start thinking about it. Uh, the week 11 module covers the final paper process and proposal. So you can go there in the week 11 module. It'll be all laid out for you, what's expected. And of course, during that week, I will also be going over that um, as well before the homework's due. Just wanted to get you thinking about it now. Okay, let's move on. Public relations, also known as PR, is a way for companies, organizations, or people to enhance their reputations. This tap, task is typically performed by professionals uh, or PR firms on the behalf of their clients. Includes performing through the media. Uh, the people who do this are called PR agents. There's any number of agents, uh, lots and lots of agents working for any one company. And they arrange, uh, they, they write press releases, arrange press conferences and act as a spokesperson when needed. So one of the big functions of, of PR is reputation management. You know, advertising is going to be used to sell products, but your brand, uh, your reputation within the public is handled by your PR. And they the PR firms will monitor a, a firm's entire online presence, uh, giving the appearance of their involvement and concern when needed. So online reputation management, blog posts, review sites, forums, press releases, social media. So they'll be commenting, refuting bad statements, uh, you know, saying good things about the company. Um, these are all the various uh, public relations professionals. These folks are all pretty much the same. Each individual one might be slightly different, but this is kind of what they do. They're also known by these terms as well. So a distinction here, PR versus advertising, public relations versus advertising. So uh, advertising you pay for, public relations you try to earn. So maybe uh, during Black History Month, uh, a corporation might run some sort of campaign and promote Black history through their company. And that's a way that they um, get covered in the media. And they don't pay for that. That's earned media. So advertising builds exposure. Public relations builds trust. Audience is skeptical of advertising because the, the point of advertising is to sell you something. I mean, going into it, there's a, uh, an attempt to, to convince you, to manipulate you. But uh, media, uh, public relations is designed to give the idea that the, the, the coverage is earned and that the company is, is a really good company. It's the kind of one that shares your values, okay? Um, advertising is expensive. It's not easily trusted. Public relations builds trust and brand loyalty. Now, Bernays, who we've discussed in the previous lesson, disdained advertising as blunt and obvious. He favored PR to influence behavior, not just induce purchases. So why hire a PR firm? Here's all the many reasons. Here's all the ways that you uh, they can improve your business. They're gonna drive a lot more traffic to you. Um, let's get to the beginning. It all began in New York in the 1920s. Edward Bernays, who we covered previously, considered the father of pa uh, public relations. Here's a book he wrote on the topic. After World War I, Bernays and his wife opened their own public relations office in New York City, the Council on Public Relations. The first clients included the US War Department, which wanted to persuade businesses to hire returning war veterans and the Lithuanian government, which was lobbying for recognition by the US. Now here's a, a, from a book that Bernays wrote in 1928. Remember he founded uh, PR, uh, this PR firm in the mid twenties. Um, so here, here's what he says. The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in a democratic society. 
those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. So go ahead and read this paragraph. This is from Bernays' 28, uh, 1928 book, Propaganda, where he's really laying out his true intentions. And what this is about is not just selling people goods, but really controlling the thinking of a massive number of people, especially as populations begin to grow through the 20th century. We have all these mass democracies like America was and is. The need to influence people became more and more important. Here's an example of uh, Bernays' influence. Uh, Bernays helped the Aluminum Company of America, known as Alcoa, and other special interest groups to convince the American public that water fluoridation was safe and beneficial to human health. This was achieved by using the American Dental Association in a highly successful media campaign. Bernays says, if we understand the mechanism and motives of the group mind, it is now possible to control and regiment the masses according to our will without them knowing it. Now, the practice of fluoridation is uh, skeptical in the minds of some, and even the European Commission in their extensive research of it has found no benefit to water fluoridation compared with topical use. Yeah, let's uh, hear from a few other people. Here's Noam Chomsky, um, known media and society cricket, critic. Here's what he said. The American business community was also very impressed with the propaganda effort. This is talking about Bernays in World War I. They had a problem at that time. The country is becoming formally more democratic. A lot more people were able to vote and that sort of thing. The country is becoming wealthier and more people could participate and a lot of new immigrants were coming in. So we're talking about the early 20th century when the American population is exploding. So what do you do? It's going to be harder to run things as a private club. Therefore, obviously you have to control what people think. There've been public relations specialists but there was never a public relations industry. The main one was Edward Bernays, straight from World War I and the White House. Bernays says, regiment the public mind every bit as much as an army regiments their bodies. So that's some criticism of propaganda by uh, Jacques Ellul, who we've heard before. Um, propaganda proceeds by uh, psychological manipulations, uh, character modifications, by creation of stereotypes useful when the time comes. The two great routes that this sub-propaganda takes are the conditioned reflex and the myth. Let me break those down. So when he's talking about the conditioned reflex, what he's saying is cultivating emotional responses. So you show someone an image and they have an emotional response to it. They don't think, they just react. So we're dealing with reactions and the irrational mind, which we learned last week from Freud. When we talk about myth, we're talking about cultivating national myths, the, the great American pride, uh, the infallibility of America, heroes and villains, legends. Okay, so when we cultivate those ideas in the public, it's more easy to manipulate them through propaganda. So another major function of PR is damage control. Okay, when the news is bad for a client is in trouble, PR firms step in with their damage control team to co coordinate the legal response to make sure that the right messaging gets out for the client and the situation is mitigated. So there's a lot of these folks through time. Here's a, a, a PR professional commenting on the damage control. Here's a book by a celebrity damage control spin doctor. Okay, celebrities always need someone to come in and clean up a mess or make sure their image isn't uh, mod, uh, damaged. Any public statement made by a corporation or celebrity is edited and approved by a public relations professional, or, or in fact, it's written for them. They will ensure that the statement is in alignment with the goals and has no potentially offensive or embarrassing words. Basically, they admit no fault and sugarcoat any bad news. So what we call this is spin. So this is a term that's used in um, media and in PR. Uh, spin is considered one form of propaganda. Spin retells the story to the advantage of the client. Spin tries to change the way the public views a client or the event in the news, okay? So something bad happens, you spin it in a way that makes your client sound somehow less bad. Uh, a spin doctor is a spokesperson employed to give favorable interpretations of events to the media, especially on behalf of a political party. For example, the president has what's called a press secretary. Their job is to go before the press weekly and spin the news or answer questions in a way that's favorable to the administration. 
But here's an early example of spin and damage control, the Ludlow Massacre. This was an attack by the Colorado National Guard uh, and fuel company camp guards on a tent colony of 1,200 striking coal miners in Ludlow, California, Colorado. Some 24 people were killed, including wives and children. The owner of the mine, John D. Rockefeller, was widely criticized for deploying violent tactics against his workers. Here's a couple headlines in a magazine from the day. Howard Zinn said it was perhaps the most important uh, and culminating event of a violent struggle between workers and management. So uh, Rockefeller hires a spin doctor, Ivy Lee, and he goes into damage crawl, control. And he issued uh, something called a press release and he issued these daily and this was a first. So the, the, the term press release originates with Ivy Lee. Uh, and he put out a large volume of disinformation, including alternative truths that foster do a doubt. He got other journalists to write articles which propose alternative narratives for why this happened. And eventually he, he bombed the, the local um, government and the local uh, press with so much information that he sort of overwhelmed and began to kind of shift the story. He spun it and got people doubting uh, what they had first heard in the initial headlines. Additionally, he got Rockefeller to create the Rockefeller Foundation, currently valued at $5 billion. And his other famous thing, photo ops with Rockefeller giving dimes to children, as you see pictured here. And by the end of his life, he was more famous for this than the Ludlow Massacre. So the Rockefeller Fo Foundation was created at Lee's urging, urging with the uh, uh, purpose of changing the image of the Rockefellers. It worked brilliantly. The philanthropic pursuits and preeminent legacy ranked the Rockefeller F Foundation amongst the most influential NGOs in the world. Through enormous grants, they gained access and allegiance to a from a variety of artists, politicians, intellectuals, and educators the world over. Propagates the family name, business, image, and status in one act that cost them a fraction of their, por of their fortune, which is, nothing to, which is to say nothing of the tax break they get from that. Uh, here's some of the notable clients. These are the most prestigious institutes uh, in the country. Uh, Library of Congress, Harvard University, and so on and so forth. Here Rockefeller says, I always tried to turn every disaster into an opportunity. So speaking of tax evasion, um, uh, Rockefeller, uh, David, uh, Nelson Rockefeller later went on a Capitol Hill. Oh, excuse me, David Rockefeller went on Capitol Hill on, to defend uh, his philanthropy and to ask Congress for mercy when writing new tax rules for foundations. While extolling the benefits of untaxed charity, Rockefeller stated that since 1961, he had not been obligated to pay a cent in income taxes. Due to generous write-offs, Rockefeller and his team of lawyers had fixed the game. He voluntarily paid between 5 and 10% of his income taxes in each year, far below the percentage for his tax bracket. And here's the direct quote from David Rockefeller about this uh, very issue. So damage control, here's another great example. This is from the pandemic. Managers at, Tyson's, uh, managers at Tyson Foods Plant in Iowa earned a spot on the list of worst 2020 PR disasters when they allegedly ordered employees to report for work while they secretly wagered money on the number of workers who would contract COVID-19. Wow. Organized a cash buy-in, winner-take-all betting pool for supervisors and managers. So when this story got out, Tyson went into damage control. Here's a statement they made from a press release. We have suspended without pay the individuals allegedly involved and have retained this law firm to do our PR campaign, okay? Uh, as a result, of course, all those individuals were fired, but they put together this website and these images that I, you see here, I collected from that website. They created uh, beating COVID together. So you see all these images, you see a worker getting injected. Tyson Foods responded with this website and firing the managers in question. There are numerous lawsuits in the courts from families of dead workers. Tyson escaped any public blowback from the incident due to the pandemic taking over headlines in 2020. Okay. So when something goes bad, uh, companies respond with a sort of aggressive PR, uh, creating a website, um, um, getting their name in the press, uh, doing some charity, uh, trying to spin the story and make people forget about it. Now, here's another example of a different tactic. So Taco Bell was sued by a customer for deceptive marketing. She complained that the tacos contain less beef than they complain. Pretty, pretty frivolous. Taco Bell quickly responded by counter-suing. 
okay? And they posted this, thank you for suing us campaign, all right? And here's what it looks like. Uh, they they, they kind of came out with this ag aggressive um, campaign, uh, PR campaign, and it worked. Uh, eventually, she dropped the suit, all right? So for big brands, reputation is everything. And Taco, Taco Bell secured its place in the Crisis Management Hall of Fame by being decisive, quick, and entertaining, okay? You got to know your audience. So the countersuit is a very effective technique. When you're sued, you sue the person suing you, okay? The opposing lawsuit against the party bringing a lawsuit against you, all right? It creates the appearance of legal equanimity, distracts the media, puts opponents on the defensive, and it buries their legal team in work. And what it also continues to do is prolong the proceedings. So maybe what the public hears is, uh, you're suing me, but I'm suing you. So well, they don't know the details. They might just think, oh, we're, we're both upset. We both have equal points, okay? Now, the destructive countersuit was pioneered by New York lawyer Roy Cohn, lawyer to disgrace Senator Joe McCarthy and Donald Trump. So here we see a picture of Trump uh, in his younger days with Roy Cohn. And here's a cartoon of one of their particular cases together. Cohn used the countersuit as a battle tactic to keep opponents at bay and influence the media narrative. The countersuit costs your opponents time and money and gives the appearance of equal weight uh, to arguments, okay? Now, the merits of the countersuit are irrelevant. They often don't even matter. The fact that you did it means it's going to get in the news, and it'll only come out later what the details of the countersuit are. So damage control is often about denial. And here we have an example from Deepwater Horizon BP Gulf oil spill in 2010. In the days after the complete loss of the rig, BPR, BP PR tactics included, okay, denial of an oil leak at the wellhead. Okay, didn't happen. Acknowledging a small amount of oil leakage, and then finally admitting larger and larger amounts of leaking oil, but still underestimated the actual size. So in other words, when the story first comes out, that's when most people will read it. And if you can somehow bring the numbers on the amount of oil that was released down, so the first thing people hear is, oh, maybe just a couple thousand gallons, then that will, will be what sticks in most people's mind. Uh, they even withheld live video of the oil spill at the wellhead. So this is essentially a cover up. And this is what media uh, PR firms will do. And then also they'll create distractions. So maybe BP will do a charity event or There'll just be a distraction that kind of takes the heat and takes the public eye off a news event. Things move quickly through the news cycle. What you don't want to do is become the top story when you have uh, a negative event. Another example of this is called Armstronging. Okay, this is delay and deny. So basically putting off the knowledge of, that you did anything wrong, which uh, Lance Armstrong managed to do for many, many years. He now admits he lied. But this was long after his glory days, long after he'd received all the money for endorsements and whatever, okay? Now, once you get caught, you go on an apology tour, as we see Lance Armstrong here doing with Oprah. And Oprah is the most famous and maybe the most important person that you want to be on an apology tour with. So what we're talking about here is artful lying, okay? Um, people can relate to and understand each other through language. And in public relations, it's important for the language that you use to target the audience you want to reach. Talk to people in the words they understand, even if those words are lies. And Brene says, you're not really uh, lying if the lies you tell are to counter other lies. Now, here's a quote from an anonymous PR agent. I began my PR career committed to the truth, but honestly, I'm struggling. I don't want to lie, but creeping skepticism about the knowledge that our competitors lie make it harder for me to remain honest. Okay, that brings us to our first question. Discuss two techniques used by public relations and provide examples of them you have seen online. So uh, uh, remember what we just discussed, discuss two techniques used by public relations and provide examples of them you have seen online. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and move on. You can stop or you can ride with me. PR practices. Okay, a couple of things, unified response and narrative. So you wanna make sure your messaging is clear, 
unified and singularly focused. You don't want people's, you don't want just anyone saying something and responding to the media. That's usually why you have one person, a spokesperson. That way you can control the narrative through one person. That one person is in on the whole plan, in on the unified response. You don't want just individual employees mouthing off and saying whatever. So you have a unified response and you control the narrative. You control the narrative, you control the people. Owning your narrative means that you make sure what is told about you matches the way you'd like it to be told. Controlling the narrative can be beneficial for the manipulator for many reasons. They can decide whether they are the hero deserving praise or the victim in need of sympathy. Hashtag gaslighting. Sound familiar? So there's a lot of ways to get the story out. You can do a press release, press conference, interviews, appearances on talk shows. You could work through influencers. That's the new thing. And of course, photo ops and the PR float. Uh, Lance Armstrong said, I tried to control the narrative. All right. So what is narrative? Your PR narrative has to show that you can do for your customers uh, what you can do for your customers and make your company appear essential to them. So it's the story that you tell about yourself. Oh, we're a great company. We're looking out for the environment. We care about women's rights. We care about LGBTQ issues. So it's the, the narrative that gets developed about you, the sort of mythos that develops around a company or a celebrity or a candidate. So one of the ways is through the press release. You can see all the details here. You want to have an attention grabbing headline. You have all the immediate information, the important information up here. And then you get to the actual story, the actual information. But you want all this information very clear. That way, someone who's writing a story uh, has all the information in front of them. You don't want them to have to search for it. Okay. So here's the times when you want to get it out. Basically, the middle of the week, uh, earlier in the day. Okay. And this is the basic tool of PR. And there's thousands of these released every day by celebrities, by firms. And they're designed to control the narrative by authoritatively explaining events uh, to the liking of the client. And increasingly, as we've seen, the press release has replaced actual news research. Remember, the press releases go to news agencies. And if the reporters don't have time to check all the details, they'll just write the story right from the press release. That's why it's very powerful. Also, we have press conferences. They're called to make important announcements. And um, keep in mind that the questions, uh, they will only take questions from friendly reporters or they'll, they'll try to control the message. They don't want to be scrutinized. They're there to get their message out. You throw a press conference to get your story out. And, and the risk is that you allow some reporter to ask an uncomfortable question. Timing. So you want to think about what the best timing for your event, the, the significance, uh, the importance of the amount, announcement has to be clear. The proximity, are you doing it near to where the events took place? The prominence, you know, using celebrities or voices of importance really work, uh, fame works. And then human interest, you need an angle that's endearing to get even more press. So maybe you tie it to a holiday or you tie it to a recent death. Okay, anytime a famous actor dies, you're going to see their movies up on Netflix because people are talking about that person and thinking about that person. So those movies will show up. And here we see a couple of examples, George Bush declaring victory uh, in the Iraqi war on a, on a battle cruiser. And anytime you see photos of, of countries' leaders meeting, you always see a photo just like this because the image says more. People don't have to read the article. They're going to see that and say, okay, Israel and Turkey are getting along and talking. So press conferences, staging has changed over time. In the old days, you, you typically had someone on stage alone, as we see here with Nixon, right? In the more modern era, we see people put behind the speaker. Now, this is all done for the camera, okay? Because it emphasizes the image. Um, this uh, Here, Trump looks completely supported by a bunch of people, okay? Here, Nixon looks alone. No one would want to ever go and see their favorite person from behind, you know, and look at them speak from behind. This is all done to control the image and, and um, uh, project a positive image of popular support. Uh, okay, a couple terms, PR float, trial response or, or declaration to test the response and prep audience. It's sometimes called a trial balloon. So when you're, you're not sure about something, you might do a, tr a PR float or a trial balloon. You might just let something leak out. We'll come back to that. There's PR cycles about when it's optimal to, re to reveal information. 
And then also what you're really looking for as a PR agent is favorable publicity, unpaid favorable coverage from an external and supposedly unbiased source um, that can be useful to your reputation. Now, often these unbiased sources are paid for, as we'll get into. So the PR float, sometimes called a trial balloon, a project or scheme tentatively announced in order to test public opinion. It can be used by companies sending out press releases to judge reaction by customers or by politicians who deliberately leak information on a policy change under consideration. See how the public uh, responds. So that's often done from, through leaks. Very often leaks are done intentionally because they want the information in the press before the big announcement to sort of prepare people and also gauge uh, response and gauge reaction. Um, here we see in the recent tabloids, uh, the Bradys are getting divorced and uh, this, his wife, Giselle Bunchen, giving this, um, this, uh, this interview, I mean, she's doing that to get her narrative out there. She's getting ahead of the story. Both of these people are public figures, and they're going to want to remain popular in the public eye so they can sell more magazines, more tennis shoes, whatever. And so they're getting a hold ahead of the narrative and putting out messages uh, to make sure they come out sounding the way they want. So timing is really important. You, you got to get ahead of bad news, and that'll mitigate damage. And good timing can garner more attention in the press, okay? Uh, now, there are optimal times to release things. So uh, you bury bad news on the weekend, holidays, or any kind of busy time during the year. If there's some other big event going on, good to slip your bad news in at the same time because people will forget about your stuff and focus on the issue, on the current issue. Announce good news around significant events or important anniversaries. Uh, you have a death of someone or it's, um, you know, a special uh, anniversary uh, for women or for um, uh, people of color or something. And you announce your event that's connected to that at the same time. Um, more information on when to release it. You know, um, it's all a strategy to sort of propagate your narrative. So getting other sources to write favorably about you is your uh, favorably about your client is one of the PR agent's biggest coups. This is often a arranged pre quid pro quo or through back channel connections. All right. So what are we talking about? This is sometimes called a puff piece, a journalistic form of puffery, an article or story of exaggerated praise for a public figure that ignores uh, opposing information. So we know now that there are fake influencers. Um, there are a lot of use of bots. So all of a sudden, uh, a lot of bots will go to your post and like it, make it seem like lots of people are liking it. You can get free Instagram followers. All of these sort of fake things or purchased popularity can be used to make you look more popular, to make your ideas, your, your quotes, your posts seem more popular than they actually are. This is called earned media, supposedly comes from an independent source, and it must appear earned. If, it, if, the, if the PR agent puts it out in a press release, well, of course he's going to put out the story. The, the public's looking for that. But when it comes from a supposedly independent source, it has much more effect. A couple of examples, though. Here we have Business Insider saying McDonald's is flipping its iconic arches upside down again for International Women's Day. Now, this is advertising and PR for McDonald's um, for no cost. This is a free, this is earned advertising, okay? Now, they're not advertising hamburgers to the people, but they're showing, hey, McDonald's is a good company. So they're building trust, building the brand name, and this is free, and this is the best kind of PR. Um, of course, doing a big, huge stunt like uh, the Macy's Day Thanksgiving Day Parade, it's a huge advertisement for Macy's. It's a beautiful, fun event. It's now a national tradition, happens every year. And that's what it is. It's a publicity stunt. Other examples include the whole relationship between Kim Kardashian and Pete Levinson. Maybe they were in love, but for sure, that relationship attracted a lot of attention to both of them, kept her in the spotlight, which is her PR team's objective. She's someone that always wants to be talked about. She doesn't actually create anything, but needs to be constantly discussed to keep her relevant. Pete Davidson's profile definitely went up because of this relationship. Another quick example, here's Lizzo. She decided to do a little twerking uh, at a Lakers game. Now that might be considered bad publicity, but it keeps her name. She's got a bad girl reputation. Um, this is only gonna add. And of course, because it was a Laker games, it got photographed and it went out to the media. P.T. Barnum, 
the great uh, circus promoter and carnival huckster said, all publicity is good publicity. Now he was even known to pin letters to the editor under assumed names, outing some of his attractions as hoaxes just to generate publicity and keep a story alive. Publicity is about remaining in the public mind. So even sometimes bad publicity can work for you. So what does uh, Jacques have to say? The propagandist must utilize all the technical means at his disposal, the press, radio, TV, um, movies, posters, meetings, door-to-door -door canvassing. There is no propaganda as long as one makes use in a sporadic fashion and at random of a newspaper article here or a poster or radio program there. So what he's really saying is you have to use all the tools. You want to have flyers. You want to have a little bit of this, a little bit of that. You want it to be sporadic and spread around so it doesn't seem overwhelming. But when people see it in multiple places, big and small, they tend to believe it. Another great example, interviews and appearances, okay? Celebrities P PR agents approach talk shows to schedule promotional experiences, okay? Now, often these are arranged well in advance and um, they're conditional upon meeting the publicist's demands. Um, it's made to look loose and spontaneous, but it's very carefully scripted. Okay, rumor and innuendo. Yes, word of mouth is still a powerful tool and PR firms will actually circulate word of mouth campaigns. They'll go and talk to people who are influential and uh, this is done most obviously through social media. It's still a powerful tool, but they actually will have what's called a word of mouth campaign where they'll try to influence people that way. So here's influencers. Today's young people are employed by brands to influence their peers through social media, podcasts and blogs. They can become very powerful tools to manipulate public opinion and drive business. So here you can see, this is from a few years ago, but you can see that the, the market for this is just exploding. Um, the marketers realize that this generation, this young generation in particular, responds much more favorably to um, their own generation, especially on social media. Social media has given all generations, but especially young generations, a new, unique, powerful platform. Uh, influencers are the star of that platform and they're growing importance. So they are being used. So <clears throat> social media, we think about it, has really evolved into a marketplace. Okay. 90% of consumers trust peer recommendations. 71 say they're more likely to make a purchase based on social media referrals. Marketers know this. Okay. And so uh, I love this quote, influencer culture takes some of the worst parts of modern life, the importance of physical beauty, competition, consumerism, and monetizes them. So that's what we see happening with social media. Uh, last example, this was a, a uh, Russian influencer who literally taped his girlfriend to the car and drove around uh, filming it, all to get attention, all to drive contact, uh, content and make him more influential. Therefore, someone will want to hire him. Photo ops are huge. Politicians always, always want to see, be seen with children. I love this quote by Hitler. No politician should ever be him, let himself be photographed in a bathing suit. But what does he mean? You don't want to ever be looking too relaxed or ridiculous, as some people do in bathing suits, when you're this a figure of importance and, and even of dread, uh, especially dictators and fascists. Um, photo ops are controlled. Vladimir Putin is often photographed shirtless and athletically engaged. I mean, this doesn't happen by accident. He put this out there to, to sort of put out this image of him being this tough guy. Um, here's another photo op uh, from the 20s. Now today, this would be very not cool. This would be cultural appropriation. In the 20s, the culture wasn't so advanced. And P uh, Calvin Coolidge's PR agent, who happened to be Edward Bernays at the time, put him up to doing this. And this flew it then, wouldn't have flown now. A couple other examples from you know, PR opportunities that were widely criticized. Trump holding up an upside down Bible during protests and Michael Dukakis getting in a, tr a tank to try to improve his image as a tough guy. Both kind of backfired on the candidates. So back to Jacques again. He says, again, I want to emphasize that the study of propaganda must be conducted within the context of a technological society. Propaganda is called upon to solve problems created by technology, to play on maladjustments and to integrate the individual into a technological world. Okay, so what does he mean by that? So just did a little deep dive. So we live in a technological world. 
we're waking up to a machine. Okay, we've got thousands of emails to uh, to respond to. We've got bills. We're dealing with traffic in the technological world. The cities have gotten bigger and bigger, and we live further and further away. We get hacked. So modern stress needs propaganda to soothe the pain. Most people uh, have somewhat of a stress from modern life, particularly if they're working in an office or they're just constantly on the computer. So when you get home, what do you see? The good times, television shows about life, uh, reminders to be a good wife, sister, and, 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 and mother, video games to distract you. So the, the propaganda and the, and the message tell you to keep working harder for a better life and to distract yourself with entertainment. Um, because the, the existence in a technological world is so challenging. I don't know. What do you think? Is that true? Is the technological world need propaganda to help us get through? So here's one thing. You might say, well, how do they know all this information about us? How do they know us better than ourselves? Well, that's from market research. And there's many different kinds. Uh, last week, we talked about vows, um, values and lifestyles from the advertising unit. But they're always doing focus groups, interviews, observation, direct store observation through using surveillance cameras, surveys with customers. You can often get paid to do some of these things. And of course, user data. Okay. And as you can see, this, this is the, the global ref, revenue from market research industry. It's only gone up. We're talking in billions of dollars. So they're spending $73 billion to research people to be able to sell them things better. They're doing that for a reason. And one of their biggest tools, of course, is big data, okay? Big data. So, hey, everybody, are you watching a TV show on Netflix? Are you shopping on Amazon, browsing Chrome, using TikTok? If you answered yes, then big data technologies are firmly a part of your life. All of these services are collecting and processing, ma processing massive amounts of data known today as big data. And here's some of the places they're getting it from. So it's a collection of personal data that is huge in size and growing exponentially with time. We sort of collectively call this big data and companies are investing billions of dollars to build these huge data centers, usually somewhere far off in the desert or something. And they're created to analyze and identify patterns in the chaos of information. Consumer data is constantly collected and sold online because once you collect it you can sell it to multiple different companies okay so you don't know this is a big issue once again we see how in 2019 it, it was worth 189 billion dollar industry now it's jumped to 274 billion dollar industry in just three years the world created a total of 1.7 zeta bytes of data in the year 2003 now that's in the internet age that's a couple of years in the internet age but that's all we produced nowadays 1.7 megabytes of data earned every created every second for every person on earth. Okay, this is a product of the information age. This is what we're living in. So the benefits of big data, predicting customer behavior, predicting products or service sales, analyzing social network comments for consumer sediment, analyzing web click streams. So it's not just about selling you something, it's learning what you want and what you desire, what your complaints about a company might be, what ways they might be able to market or sell you in the future. So big data. So I, um, human, that's you, all right, um, visits the website. And then an avatar is created for you and the avatar records uh, choices and preferences, okay? So every one of us has an avatar that were created for you that has all the information that the company that's collecting your data knows about you. The human connects with the friends. Avatar records sites visited, friends network. Human surfs the web, joins groups. Avatar determines political, social, and personal views. Okay, so we each have an avatar, maybe many of them through many different data companies that are used to sell us. Here's what it looks like. Consumer uses computer uh, data collected by websites. Con consumer data is sold and the form of an avatar about you, hundreds of avatars of hundreds of people. Data used in marketing, PR, and advertising. Consumer is exposed to that marketing. Marketing. Consumer makes purchases online with a credit card, and that information just cycles in the system. Okay, so a lot of these companies that collect this data will will sell it to larger collection data companies, and so on and so forth. 
So just to explain what big data is, it's really advanced analytics. Those of you who are sports fans, you know, from the movie Moneyball, that starting in the 2000s, baseball began using much more advanced analytics to improve player evaluation and performance. So they weren't just measuring hits or steals. They went a lot further in measuring speed and situations, how the player performed. And this wealth of new data revolutionized sports, and it changed the way players are evaluated and are paid. Now, every moment they are on the field or court, they are being observed, measured, and ranked. And this has made uh, evaluating players much easier, but a little tougher on the players. So a couple of big data issues real quickly. Uh, data breaches of privacy. Uh, Morrison Supermarket 2020 lost 100,000 employees. Um, data breach use, you, Yahoo 2013. 30 billion users affected, including names, telephone numbers, dates of births, encrypted passwords. That can become a real security issue if uh, they have some passwords that can break into your accounts. And then lastly, manipulation. Cambridge Analytica harvested personal information from a huge swath of the electorate to develop deceptive techniques used in the 2016 election. Okay, so these are all the issues with uh, big data. One, two more quickly. Uh, this is a chart that was uh, that was mapped out from Facebook. Facebook knows when people break up based on their Facebook posts. They know when people are breaking up, least likely day on Christmas Day. But as you can see here, they've mapped out when are the times of the year that people break up based just on their posts, not from a survey, just based on what they wrote in their posts. They can tell when people tend to break up. Uh, another um, app it allows you to track women around you. Now, I blocked out the name because um, I don't want to advertise that, but this allows the tracking of women nearby. They don't even have to be in your friend's network or even be using the same apps you are because this app goes and searches other apps looking for just the location of women around. Pretty creepy, and this is all a function of big data. Here's a sort of breakdown of all the things that we know big data uh, knows about us. All right, we're at question two. How is big data being used to monitor society and influence behavior? How is big data being used to monitor society and influence behavior? That's your second question. You can go to the discussion now and answer it and take a break, or you can continue with me. Here we go. Okay, what can you do? A lot of this is very frustrating. Maybe some of you know this information. What can you do? Media literacy. It's your defense against media manipulation. Media literacy is the ability to access and analyze media me messages as well as create, reflect, and take action. So I want you to develop critical thinking skills around all types of media. Build an understanding of how media messages shape our society. Develop tools to recognize media manipulation. So this is really the whole crux of the entire course. The 21st century literacy means media literacy. Uh, we live in a world of powerful 24 seven media. Education and media literacy now is essential for every citizen, especially the young. Interpreting messages and understanding manipulation are needed in a media dominated culture. Wouldn't you agree? Governments are doing it. Many governments have begun um, manipulating uh, on uh, social media sites, trying to make sure they get their message out. So what do you do? Uh, this is from the Center for Media Literacy. I want you to ask yourself these questions about media messages. Any message that you come across, who created this message? What creative techniques are used to attract my attention? Mm -hmm. What are they doing to grab my attention? Emotion, you know, flashy images. How might other people understand this message differently? So someone who's not me, someone from a different race, or a woman versus a man, how might uh, other people understand this message differently? What values and points of view are, are represented in or omitted from this message? And why is this message being sent? So what's the intent? What's the real intention here? Okay, quote here, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. Media literacy practices. Here's a couple of things to think about. Check uh, multiple sources. So you diver diversify your sources of information, not just one. Gauge the tone in the language. In other words, you, what manipulative language is being used? Are they using a lot of critical adjectives or derogatory adjectives? 
uh, question numbers and figures. Are the stats reliable? Are they biased? Because oftentimes stats can be manipulated. Recognizing bias, including your own. Who, who has written this piece and what is their angle? Why are, is this someone who typically attacks this same person? Is this that's just more of the same or is this a, a different, something different? And then understanding images. How are you affected by dramatic images? We live in a visual society and images are often more powerful. So take a look at this. We have the sender whoever, and we have the receiver, and the message goes through a medium, okay? So it's the magazine article, it's the movie, it's the television show, it's the advertisement. This brings us back to the idea the medium is the message, okay? We must understand always the way a message is being conveyed is just as important sometimes as the message itself. So here's an example we can talk about. Here's an article from Town Hall which is known to be a conservative news cartoon uh, website. So you can, you can see that they have a definite slant and the audience of this, since it's conservative, is going to, the audience of this source is going to be receptive to this message because they're, they're attacking a Democrat here. And they're saying, um, Adam Schiff got caught celebrating impeachment at a swanky steakhouse. Okay, so, so the question is, was he hiding his actions? They say he got caught, maybe he just went to a steakhouse. Uh, some judgmental words here, swanky stank house. That's made us, that's a word that's kind of designed to make us feel a certain way, a judgmental uh, adjective. Um, the language they're using indicates their bias. And of course, they selected a pretty guilty looking photo right here. He almost looks embarrassed, but embarrassed. And we have some speculation. Apparently, they're celebrating. They don't know that for sure. Just speculation. Manipulative language. We see this a lot. Here's Business Insider again, um, uh, sort of saying Trump gloated. Here's the Daily Wire uh, criticizing um, uh, AOC. Um, so if you see language in an article or PR or in news that is uh, critical or descriptive or judgmental or derogatory, you know, calling someone um, um, silly or um, egregious or stupid, or uh, these words are telling you how to think about the person. They're an they're a adjective which has intent behind it, okay? It's not just giving you factual information. So beware of judgmental adjectives that tell you how to think. So manipulative photos, oh no. Looks like uh, this got out of place here. I don't know what happened, but um, so this is just some photos here. You can see the uh, Prince Charles, for, or uh, Prince Edward, I don't know, which one of the princes, uh, depending on the angle of the photo. Um, here's a photo of uh, Trump's inauguration. Looks pretty good, but eh, when you got a wide shot, eh, not that many people there. Can't tell from that photo. Here's a, a, a photo of Obama connected to the BP oil crisis. So, you know, very often how the photos frame tells us a lot, right? I mean, here she was obviously in the photo. They photoshopped her out. Now, this one you probably can't tell, but do you notice how these fans look like these fans look like these fans? That's because they actually cut and paste fans and repeated them to make them look like there was a lot more people behind this. This is this image has been photoshopped. Maybe the stands were empty and they didn't want the fans to know that nobody went to the game. So these are all examples of how uh, images can be manipulated. This one with Photoshop, this with angle and this just um, with cropping these two with cropping. So we're talking about media narratives, okay? And um, this is PR firms and entities, celebrities wanna create a media narrative. I mean, this whole narrative about um, these two breaking away from the royal family is, a, is just that a media narrative designed to make them look cool and interesting and hip and somehow different and to keep them engaged and their battle with the royal family somehow shows up in the media. I don't understand why most people care about that, but some people do. And it's just a way of generating a story, generating gossip and keeping the royals on the tips of people's tongues. Uh, another example too, is just how people are presented. So here, theater shooting suspect was a brilliant science subject or student. Well, here we go, he, he looks very normal, but then Michael Brown struggled with officers before the shooting. We have a photo of him here. I'm looking down at the camera. The whole way that the press has presented this creates two different narratives from the way the language and the photos are used. So in very subtle ways, media builds a narrative in the way that they present information before you even get to the story. So you got to fight the fake. 
because everyone has to practice media literacy, literacy. It's your responsibility to be informed, not misinformed. So choose your sources wisely, proceed with caution, trust expertise. When in doubt about a source, check the author's qualifications. Uh, expand your search and understand the context. In other words, don't just understand the, the single event. How does it relate to other events? So media literacy tools, um, these are just a bunch of great places that you can go. All sides is a, is a, is a dictionary for terms used by left-right media. Um, Google reverse image search allows you to uh, search the origins of any image you can find. So there's just a couple of sources there. You can take a screenshot of this if you want to refer to any of these places. And these will be very good uh, sources for you to go to in terms of your final paper proposal and research. Maybe you'll find some good information there. So wrapping it up, we're going to go into propaganda techniques, uh, the evolution of public relations. In general, only simple concept conceptions take hold of the minds of the people. A false idea, but one clear and precise, will always have more power in the world than a true but complex idea. This is from Alexis de Tocqueville, uh, one of the great lovers of American democracy. So we see that uh, uh, public relations has evolved from scratching on the ground all the way to where we are now as we've evolved through technology. It really kind of covers a lot of what we discussed in the class. So we know propaganda, it comes in all different shapes. We tend to think of uh, Chinese or Soviet propaganda, but America has uh, created propaganda as well. This is a a World War II poster. Uh, propaganda has always been a part of society. Everyone loves a good story. And all propaganda is, is essentially that, a story. There will be heroes and villains. That's why I brought that concept up at the very beginning of class. Here, the creation of heroes and villains. Um, a group of people will be blamed for all your troubles, and there'll be someone to save you. In the past, the story was spread through posters and speeches, but today, of course, it's spread mostly through online. Bernays says, the extent, the extent to which propaganda shapes the progress of affairs about us may surprise even well-informed persons. He would know. So disinformation. The first step is to look for cracks in society that can be exploited. These social divisions will, will then be emphasized by mixing truth with lies. Outrageous lies seem to work the best. The truth will bring the credibility and the lies, the virality. The mix muddies the waters and creates uncertainty. Here you can see that happening in social media as confirmed by Americans' opinions of it. We live in an age of disinformation. Private correspondence gets stolen and leaked to the press for malicious effect. Political passions are inflamed online in order to, give, to drive wedges into existing cracks in liberal democracies. Perpetrators sow doubt and deny malicious activity in pu public while covertly ramping up behind the scenes. So uh, fake news is a huge problem. Um, and these things get circulated and of course a lot on social media. Emotional persuasion. The powerful emotional persuasion is incredible. We can use to create a heroic image of a leader or to convince a community that it is culturally superior to its neighbors. Now here's an example from Syria. Now of course, we, of course I wanna support Syria's children but they use this Beautifully sad photo, donate now. They're using an emotional appeal. Emotional appeal is arousing emotion to influence decision-making process. In online marketing, emotional persuasion techniques are words, visual, user experience. Once the consumer is emotional, they're much more likely to make an irrational choice, okay? Emotional persuasion, words have power. Here we see Australians, uh, this is an advertising campaign from Australia about COVID. Uh, their, their warnings were very fear-based, as you can see. Uh, here's Donald Trump. You're going to have more World Trade Centers. It's going to get worse and worse, Fox. And that's, that's using fear. It's easy to see why fear-based uh, campaigns are effective, but fear appeals can have unintended consequences. Some will recognize the use of fear and reject a valid minute message, as we saw here. Denial of truth. Welcome to the nightmarish land of post-truth politics, where the denial of truth is an acceptable political strategy. Any inconvenient fact can be simply denied. There are familiar tricks for doing so. A propagandist can simply pretend to not understand an uncomfortable question, give a vague response, or just go off on a tangent. In 2016, Trump said he didn't rain on my inauguration. Here's a photo from that day. A conspiracy is peddled by the former president. 2019 declaration. They say the noise from windmills causes cancer. 2020, the FBI is a campaign arm 
of the Democratic Party. Post-truth society, post-truth politics is creating a society where people believe that truth, concrete, measurable, and absolute doesn't exist at all. A society where a point of view matters more than reality, where we talk of your truth and of my truth. Language has been weaponized. Another quote here, it's an interesting modern phenomenon is the collapse of trust. According to the polls, people don't trust the government, politicians, journalists, and scientists, let alone bankers and business executives. Not even the Vatican has escaped this crisis of confidence. So this is what we're talking about, a post-truth society where your position, your point of view, your political persuasion is more important than whatever facts anyone can provide unless those facts agree with you. So another thing that the propagandists do is the volume. They don't just wield a handful of social media accounts to spread disinformation, but tens of thousands. The people who argued with you on the comment section could have been paid trolls. The story that outraged you might have been fake news and the tweet that had a hundred retweets was probably just a work of bots. So the, the information is weaponized. It's in a planted in promising online videos. And then once it's planted, bots and algorithms share and drive engagement with the false content. So the bots will like and say, oh, this is a great post, and then they'll share it, and it'll make it look like it's information that's really virally spreading that, wow, people are really talking about this. And this is all, this is something that you can buy. Here's the, the social media examiner here. So these are all techniques and people that you can hire to help you with this. Propaganda techniques. We're going to go through each of these one by one. The process of shaping opinion, attitudes, and perceptions was termed the engineering of consent by one of the founders of the modern public relations industry, Edward Bernays. Okay, so what we're talking about here is engineering consent. So we're going to talk about each of these. Here we go. Information overload. I'm sure you've heard of this one. Uh, it prompts disengagement from information when you've just got too much going on. Well, I think we all know this one. Remember the quote we, we brought up before, a wealth of information creates a poverty of attention. Fear, uncertainty, and doubt, also known as FUD. This is a big one. Um, you don't have to convince people. You don't have to change their mind and present alternative facts. You just have to introduce uncertainty and doubt. If they're not sure about something or if they have questions or you've shown them conflicting information, they're kind of going to do what's easiest and best for them. They'll continue smoking. They won't conserve energy. And we're going to talk a lot about this in the film that I've selected for your homework. It's called Merchants of Doubt. So really great video that, uh, that's uh, your, basically your homework assignment for this week. The Big Lie. The use of a central simple lie so colossal that no one would believe that someone could have made it up. The lie never is proven, but acts as a central unifying force. Hitler said, make the lie big, make it simple, keep saying it, and eventually they will believe it. Now, the reason we keep referring to Hitler, of course, is that Nazi Germany had one of the most devastatingly powerful propaganda machines of history. This technique can be seen in the so-called Stop the Steal movement. They claim the 2020 elections was stolen despite no credible evidence presented. After numerous bipartisan audience, no evidence was found. Yet the lie persists with constant repetition. Now, sometimes we call this gaslighting. You guys will know this term, using persistent denial, misdirection, contradiction, and lying to sow the seeds of doubt in a target individual or group. Here's what it feels like. You'll recognize some of these terms. It's just you essentially flip it around the person and act like it's they who have the problem. Repetition, tireless repetition of an idea, especially a simple slogan, if repeated enough times, may begin to take, be taken on as the truth. This pro approach is more effective alongside the propagandists limiting or controlling the media. So uh, Goebbels, the Nazi propagandist who's in charge of all this in the Nazi era, if you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. And look at this research. Majority needs to hear a message three to five times to believe it. Okay. Cult of personality, building up uh, someone's, you know, building up a hero extensively, extensively. We see that, of course, in Soviet propaganda. We also see it in the propaganda and the PR earned and otherwise about all of our tech giants, all of our um, big billionaire heroes. We live in a cult of personality of billionaires. Uh, malinformation is malicious, uh, true information targeted 
to harm the reputations or incite a response. So here, this is a great example. We see Fox News Latino in Rare Move University grants $22,000 scholarship to undocumented student. Okay, it's a positive story. Fox News Channel, money for illegals. The story is true. They didn't make it up, but it was the way they used it. This is malinformation. The way they used it to incite a response from different um, constituencies. These folks are going to be uh, touched and applaud that. These folks, uh, the, the, the audience here was going to get upset by that. That's why it was geared the way it was. Uh, propaganda tries, first of all, to create condition reflexes in the individual so that certain words, signs, or symbols, even certain persons or facts, here we go, here's the example, provoke unfailing reactions. The important thing is that when the time is ripe, the individual can be thrown into action by the utilization of those psychological levers that have been set up. Ad hominem, attacking the person, anytime you demonize name calling, you know this one. And lastly, demonizing the enemy, making individuals from the opposing side seem evil or inhumane. Once an opposing group is demonized or dehumanized, violence against them becomes justified and compromise is not conceivable. Here's a, some actual propaganda by the US uh, about Japanese soldiers carrying off, I guess, a white woman. Um, and we see this a lot on, on Fox News where there's no compromise that these people aren't people you can trust. And indeed, they are truly, truly evil. And once you get to that point, once you've demonized the enemy at that point, anything that you do to them uh, or anything you, any unwillingness you have to compromise becomes justified. Conclusion, since 2016, the digital battlefield has become more sophisticated and combative across the globe. False, inf false information about major events from COVID-19 outbreak to the 2020 US election are jeopardizing public safety and democracy. The public will have to become media literate to preserve our future as a nation. And of course, recent events point to this. Um, Jacques has to say, the aim of modern propaganda is no longer to modify ideas, but to provoke action. Teach students how to avoid being used by social media. This brings us to uh, question three. Using the examples just learned, discuss two examples you have seen of modern propaganda or disinformation. So here again, I want you to bring in examples of your own. Using examples you just learned, uh, discuss two examples you have seen of modern propaganda or disinformation. Okay, so this is different than PR tactics. I want you to tell me where you've seen, give me two examples of modern propaganda that maybe match the list that we just discussed. And lastly, week nine, public relations, answer uh, three discussion questions. We, we kind of went through all this, but I just want to remind you that um, week 11 is coming up and your final paper proposal is due. Here's the question again. Using the examples that you've just learned, discuss two examples you have seen of modern propaganda or disinformation. These can come from online, television, wherever. Okay, here we are. Uh, Hope you enjoyed this week's lesson. Reach out with any questions. Have a good week.